Hi there, and welcome back to the Energy Sector Heroes podcast. My name is Michelle Fraser, and every week I will speak with incredible people who share their lessons, experiences, and stories from their time spent in the energy sector. Hi there, and welcome back again to this week's episode. If you're new to the show, then please take a second to subscribe and even consider sharing the show with just one other person. This week, I am joined by Mark Finlay. Mark is an incredible fellow in energy and global oil. Mark, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Hi, Michelle. Thanks for having me. That pretty much sums it up. I am the fellow in energy and global oil at the James Baker Institute of Public Policy Studies at Rice University. And that's kind of a capstone of a nearly 40 year career spent in some way, shape or form touching the issues of energy, national security, geopolitics and economics. That sounds like a really interesting position that you that you hold. How did you get started off in the energy sector? Completely by accident, believe it or not, I uh, it was studying economics uh, as undergraduate and as a graduate uh, student didn't really have a particular energy background, but coming out of grad school, I uh, became aware of a job vacancy for a company in Bermuda. I thought that sounded like fun, and it turned out that it was an oil trading company. So my very first job in the industry was developing computer trading programs for an oil trading company, you know, working out of Bermuda, and uh, and it went from there. Okay, excellent. So did you have any role models during your career, and why did you find them inspirational? Lots of people have influenced me in, in different ways as analysts, as uh, leaders, you know, as friends. And, and so, um, I mean, one of the things that I that kept me working in energy, even though I had no background in it, was that it's it's always important. You know, no one no one will ever argue with you that what you do doesn't matter when you work in the energy world because it's so fundamental to our way of life. And, you know, for me personally, as an, a trained economist, I was always interested in data, but also in like human being real world issues rather than technical questions. And, you know, the energy sector is great for that because there's lots of data and people can relate to it on a very personal level. And it's intensely impacted by personal decisions, you know, both of all of us as consumers, but also, you know, you know leaders of companies and governments. So in terms of particular people, is that where you want to do a, a discuss? Yeah, well, as I was going to ask you, you were saying that the data really influences people's decisions. What type of decisions do they actually influence? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll give you an example here in the United States. I can't tell you what I pay for a gallon of milk, but I can tell you to the 10th of a cent what I pay for you know, gasoline or petrol for my vehicle, you know, because it's screamed at you from every street corner in foot high numbers you now and you know the data very objectively shows that things like consumer confidence and even politicians job approval ratings are correlated adversely with prices at the pump you know so it's something in like i said that everyone can relate to and um you know even you know over in europe where maybe the prices at the pump don't have quite that same psychological value everyone can relate to the availability of energy and we all notice it when it suddenly becomes too expensive or unavailable yeah no do you think that the price of the oil because it's high just now do you think it's going to remain high in the future Look, when I worked in the private sector for, for, for many years, we used to joke, hey, if we could predict the price of oil, we wouldn't be here. We'd be laying on a beach somewhere. Um, you know, at its core, it's volatile, it's unpredictable, but it has always been a cyclical industry that has always been prone to exaggerated booms and busts. And because it's strategic, it has always attracted efforts to manage it. You know, I mean, oil is by far the single leading source of energy around the world. You know, it's maybe eh, over a third of all of the energy consumed in the world is in the form of oil. And it has, you know, a, for now at least, heavy concentration in the transportation sector and therefore looms large in military considerations as well. And so, like I said, oil has always been, you know, perceived, you know, over its 150 year reign as the world's dominant source of energy as a strategic commodity. Do you think that that will remain the same going forward, though? 
with all the different great terms. question that is you know the one of the questions of the day isn't it you know how how quickly can we transition to a more sustainable energy system you know renewable forms of energy have been growing rapidly i should mention by the way as an aside that mm-hmm. for a dozen years i was the project manager for the bp statistical review of world energy which is you know one of the world's leading sources of just objective data on the global energy system um uh and, and i'm still a big fan of it even in my retirement uh and the you know while forms of energy like solar energy and wind have been growing rapidly renewables are still about five or six percent of the world's total energy mix fossil energy including oil natural gas and coal is more like 80 percent and so while we all want to transition as rapidly as possible to a low carbon and more sustainable energy future I think the events of the last year have really uh, underscored the centrality of energy to our economic and strategic well-being. And to me, the key takeaway is we need to make sure that we maintain a functional energy system that continues to deliver affordable, secure, reliable energy, even as we push for a transition. You know, and that system needs tending and management at each point of time along the way. But then, because the oil has been around for so many years, do you think that this transition is going to be easy or is people are going to get, get jump on board with it? Because a lot of people still want to use the oil as well because it's there and it's uh, what we've used for, for, for a long time. And, and there's lots of issues around that in terms of the uh, you know the the capital that's already been invested and the money that's already been sunk into developing a system. You know, while electric cars are growing rapidly as a share of new vehicle sales, the internal combustion engine still dominates the global fleet of vehicles. And given that a new car sold today will be on the road for probably 15 years or so, you know. That that means that we're going to be dealing with fossil and forms of energy for a long time, even in a successful case. So, and the other point I guess I would make is having spent part of my career developing long-term forecasts, nobody knows what the future holds. You know, we all know what we aspire to, but how we get there, you know, prepare to be surprised, I guess, is one of my observations. You know, we we don't know where the next technology innovation is really going to come from. And you know, here in the United States, we've you know, we're living with the implications of that in the form of the shale revolution. I can assure you 20 years ago, nobody in industry or government thought that shale was going to make the United States the biggest producer of oil and natural gas in the world, and a, not only self-sufficient, but a significant exporter of both of those energy forms. But that's what happened because of shale. And so I've seen over my career how technology innovation can surprise us. And so as we think about where we're going in the future toward a more sustainable energy system, I think one of the key points that we need to keep in mind is to keep our minds open to the possibility of surprising outcomes. I mean, at the bottom line is at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is stabilize or even reduce atmospheric concentrations of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. That could be from reducing our use of fossil fuels, but there could be other solutions in terms of changes in land use or carbon capture. And what my experience has taught me is don't rule out options as we go ahead. Try to keep our minds and our policy options and our investment options open for wherever that technology innovation might surprise us. Okay, no, excellent. Do you think restricting the production of oil is really going to is really going to be effective long term, considering a lot of the different technologies are still in, you know, there's fair enough, there's been a lot of money invested in them, but they're still at the infants and the stages. I think the events of the last year with spiking energy prices around the world, partly coming out of the, the recovery from COVID and the collapse of investment in new supply that came with that, but also following on the tales of the uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you know, the spiking energy prices have really emphasized that, you know, we can't just cut off supply of the forms of energy that dominate the world's energy system today and still have a functional energy system. And importantly, at least in democratic systems, you know, no politician who is perceived as failing to deliver 
enough affordable, reliable energy to keep the economic system functioning and keep people working and homes heated and kids getting to school, you won't remain in office long enough to deal with successfully with long-term issues like climate change if you fit are seen as failing to manage the energy system appropriately today. So the real trick is how do we manage just enough investment in supply while we're trying to reduce demand so that we can manage it down in a way that's not disruptive to our economic well-being today, even while we push for um, you know a more sustainable energy system you know as quickly as possible. The good news, I guess, Michelle, is that the one truly inexhaustible resource that we have working in our favor is human creativity. I, you know, that if we could figure out how to just make sure that the people's incentives are aligned properly with the objectives that, that we seek, both in terms of a functional energy system today and a more sustainable energy system as quickly as possible, history tells us that people will find surprising and surprisingly successful ways of addressing that when they're given the opportunity to freely explore you know, the innovative space. So do you think in the future that there'll be more opportunities for the younger generation to work in alternative energy? I think there's lots of opportunities to work in energy, period, and how we make um, it sustainable could be coming from someone who chooses to go into the oil and gas industry and invents carbon capture technology. I don't know the answer to that. And a lot of the big energy companies are investing pretty aggressively in, you know, alternative energy, but also new technology solutions, you know, ranging from um, electric, electric vehicles, you know, uh, concepts like um, different building materials, carbon capture solutions that I mentioned, hydrogen, you know, you know, ammonia as a carrier. So there's so many different, a dizzying, almost infinite array of possibilities out there. Yeah, the key is to get on with it. Do you think it's just as easy as that, just to go on with it, though? Well, um, it's not easy, you know, but like uh, President Kennedy said at Rice University all those years ago when he announced the initiative of going to the moon, you know, what makes it fun is that it's hard. Yeah. And it's important. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's where we should want to be spending our our careers, you know, working on things that are hard and important. I agree, actually. No, thank you. What is the most challenging thing you find about your current role and how do you handle it? My current role? Well, as a research fellow, I, I don't have teaching responsibilities. And so I think you know, for me, having worked my career in government and in, you know, a big multinational corporation, I'm used to working in big hierarchical organizations and, you know, the academic culture and organizational, you know, it, organization is, is very different. And so for me personally, making a transition from a, you know, big hierarchical organization, whether it was government or, you know, a big multinational company, and then going into an academic setting was a new culture to learn. And yeah, you know, but but it's also very liberating. Yeah, and in a big, a big organization, you have a very well defined role. In a smaller academic organization, you know, I've had the opportunity to write about COVID and its impact on the energy system. I've written about U.S. shale operators. I've written about Saudi oil policy. I've written about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I've written about natural gas and refining prices at the pump and what it means for the president's job approval rating. And believe it or not, even American football. Oh, wow. That's a broad scale of uh, subjects. So what made you go into more academic field? Mm -hmm. Well, having reached kind of a point in my career where I was retirement eligible, but not all the way ready to retire and still looking for a change, I, mean, I thought... You know, this would be a great place to remain active and engaged. You know, having access to students, you know, is is very invigorating. And like you mentioned, I mean, the students in the program and the young people that we interact through it are the people who are going to drive this change in the energy system in the future. And so having an opportunity, you know, to be exposed to their energy, pun intended, you know, and ideas, but also to help share perspectives, you know, to make sure that, you know, these problems are being approached in a rigorous and uh, holistic way is, you know, is a fun challenge and, and a fun opportunity. Okay. It would be, it would be quite, quite an amazing job to shape young people's minds as well. So. Here's hoping. 
Yeah. I, again, I, I don't have direct teaching responsibility, but through the things that I do, you know, I, you know, occasional guest lectures, but also just, you know, the writing, the hosting events, it's, it's, it's been, you know, a good experience for me. Yeah. I have to say the one downside for me has been the pandemic. Yeah. I'm based in the Washington DC area and travel to Houston where the Rice University campus is um, as needed. And I'm sure you can tell by our conversation, I'm very extroverted. I thrive on interacting with people and, you know, the pandemic, you know, my little, you know, 10 by 12 foot home office, you know, has been getting smaller by the day. So I'm, you know, really personally, you know, grateful that we're in the process of reopening and I have a chance to start getting out more and engaging with people, both around, you know, the energy and policy community here in DC, but also down on campus in Houston. No, that's amazing. So, you have worked in a, a number of different roles and many different from from organizations, corporate organizations to government to your to your work that you're currently doing just now. So in your opinion, what do organizations look for when they're trying to hire someone? Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny, I get a lot of young people uh, reaching out to me, you know, over the years and saying, well, how did you plan your career? And I think I always disappoint them because my answer is I never planned anything. I just worked on things I thought were fun and, and, you know, then busted my butt at it. But, you know, the idea that I, I didn't sit down when I was 22 years old and say, well, you know, how do I see my career planning out? Um, you know, to me, that was part of the fun of it. And so, you know, I think, you know, I had the, you know, the great fortune to work in government. I was an energy security specialist at the CIA for 13 years. Uh, I worked in a big multinational company. I've had the opportunity to travel all over the world. You know, but but I think, you know, one of the consistent threads through all of that is kind of a willingness to kind of raise your hand and get involved. You know, when there's a crisis in the world, you know, at, at the agency, you know, these are the kind of people who run toward the crisis and not away from it. You know, I've had, I, you know, Never served in a war zone, but I served on plenty of task forces where I was working the midnight shift, you know, and staying up all night and working long hours, nights and weekends when there was a crisis going on in the world and feeling like you were making a difference. And when BP had its tragedy in the Gulf of Mexico, I volunteered to serve on the crisis response team there as well. And I think one of the things that I would advise uh, people looking to, you know, how do you make a difference in your career is find something you enjoy and because life's too short not to, but also stick your neck out, raise your hand, you know, volunteer for different things and don't just stay in your lane. I've always advised my analysts when people would say, somebody needs to do something about that. The answer is, well, who do you think somebody is? Now, you don't have to be the manager to be the leader. You know, anyone can be the leader. And that's one of the ways that you, A, make your career more interesting and B, how you help, one of the ways you can help set yourself apart. That is really good advice because a lot of the younger, the younger generation, maybe, maybe not shy away from being taking the center stage and being a leader. What advice would you give to them? Mm-hmm. Again, it depends on what your aspirations are, but I think a couple of thoughts. Um, one is, for me as an economist, you would be surprised perhaps to learn how many chief economists of big companies did some of their career in the government. Yeah, there's something about public service that it, it, I don't know if it attracts people who are especially motivated or it provides a unique set of experiences that can then be leveraged down the road. But I frequently advise people who are looking for jobs in the energy sector to maybe you know don't rule out the possibility of going to do energy related work in government at some you know point. So, I mean, I think that's that, that's one idea. You know, there are certainly ways that you can build your skills by taking training on top of, you know, your day job, whether it's training in the substance of, you know, taking night classes in finance, which I did at one point in my career, or taking courses in briefing techniques. You can learn a lot by looking at people who you admire and how they behave. You used to always, one of my bosses at the CIA used to always, you know, people would be brainstorming of something they could do. People would stop and say, well, but are we allowed to do that? Can we do that? And his response was something I've carried with me for 30 years now. We can do whatever we want. We better be right. 
you know, and make sure that we're, you know, but, you know, again, that idea of, well, taking ownership of a problem, you know, if you see something that needs doing, do it, you know, and that kind of notion of, well, whether it's my job or not, if it needs doing and nobody else is doing it, let's get on with it. I, I personally have found to be a very empowering and liberating perspective that I think has had a lot of impact on my own professional trajectory and development. Okay, no, that's really good advice. Thank you. What has been the most challenging thing about your career and how have you handled it? Mm -hmm. I guess one, there's so many different ways to take that. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, I'm probably going to choke up talking about it. You know, you know, during at times during, you know, the BP, you know, the Deepwater Horizon tragedy, you know, the low point for me was when my kids came home from school crying because, you know, their teachers were saying, oh, BP is a horrible company. And, you know, like I said, it was a terrible tragedy, but for me, you know, just seeing the personal impact that something that I was involved with, you know, had on my family. Yeah, that was, that was, that was a tough day, you know, working at the CIA, you know, I have friends who died in the line of duty. When you walk into CIA headquarters, there's a wall with stars. Okay. You know, people who, who lost their lives in the line of duty and some of those stars were friends. Yeah, that's, that was a, that was a, you know, those are, those are tough days, but also it's something that demonstrates that what you're doing again matters and that you're making a difference. And so I guess one of the lessons is don't shy away from sticking your neck out, you know, and taking risks. Yeah. In the oil industry, people always joke, no one ever sets out to drill a dry hole. Right. But, you know, you can apply that same concept to your professional life. You know, the things that I regret are the things I didn't do, not the things that I tried and failed at. What do you, as leading on from that, I was just wondering, what do you, do you regret anything that you didn't do? What did no, you? I've been, well, I mean, I've, you know, lots of things I've failed at, you know, applied for lots of jobs that I didn't get. Yeah, you know, they certainly have, you know, tried to write, you know, papers or give presentations that that flamed out spectacularly. But that's all part of the process of growing and learning. And so, you know, I actually feel like I've been, you know, really fortunate, you know, to have had the experiences that I have, including the bad ones. I think, know, because like I said, how you learn and grow. Yeah. As long as you learn from your mistakes, I think that's the most important uh, thing. I was going to ask you, is there anything that you still want to achieve in your career? Gosh, I think at this point in my life, I'm more interested in, you know, what I want to achieve on on my personal side. uh, My my wife is retired recently, looking forward to spending more time with her. Um, You know, but you want to, I think, stay engaged and, you know, feel like you're making a difference and working on things that matter. Yeah. And then, you know, just this weekend, I found myself, you know, working working through the weekend when Saudi Arabia and other countries participating in this broader OPEC plus group announced a surprise round of oil production cuts. You know, never happens during the weekday for me. It always happened. Things like this always seem to happen on the weekend. And so, you know, spent, spent the weekend, a big chunk of it, you know, trying to understand what, what was going on and what the ramifications of it were and share that analysis with people. And, and by the way, there's a new podcast that just went up on the rice website today, you know, uh, exploring some of that. So to me, it's, it's that kind of intellectual curiosity and staying involved and engaged and finding ways to add perspective to the conversation that I think, you know, continues to motivate me. No, that's a really good answer. Thank you. I really love that answer, actually. So what is your zone of genius? What are you really excellent at? Zone of genius? Gosh. I don't think I have a, I wouldn't consider myself in the genius category, (laughs) but I think one of the things that I noticed over the course of my career, which I think is a combination of training and personality. When I was an undergraduate major in economics, I didn't really decide to do that until pretty far into my collegiate career. And so I took courses in history and political science and modern dance and theater and classical Greek and math and, you know, uh, Spanish and Czech language and, you know, anything but economics, frankly, for much of it. 
I know in much of Europe and other parts of the world, if you go to university to study economics, you study economics. Mm. And I feel like, you know, having worked for a, a European company for nearly 20 years, my colleagues who did economics were way better at economics than I was. But I think that what I was good at was connecting broader uh, threads, you know, and to say, huh, you know, there's a new leader in that country. What's that going to mean for its country's energy policy? And therefore, what is it going to mean for, you know, the marketplace that I'm studying? Or um, I'll give you an example. Early on in the shale revolution, I was watching U.S. oil production grow dramatically. And I thought, huh, I wonder what U.S. imports are doing and where does oil fit into the whole range of U.S. trade? It turns out that at the time, oil was half of America's trade deficit. Now, I'm not a macroeconomist. You know, setting the company's foreign exchange assumptions are hugely important, but you know, that's really not my area of expertise. But I found myself going to the people who did do it and saying, what should happen to the U.S. dollar exchange rate with other countries if half of America's trade deficit goes away? You know, and the, you know, because, you know, the dollar should strengthen and that, you know, the dollar as a, you know, source of exchange with other currencies matters a lot. You know, the strength of the, the exchange rate matters a lot for a company that does business in a hundred different currencies every day. And so just the ability to kind of look at the stuff that I was looking at, you know, the shale revolution, and then kind of start working out more broadly and saying, wait a minute, what does that mean for trade? What does it mean for the balance of payments? What does it mean for exchange rates? You know, to me was, um, something that I felt like I could add value at because I was good at trying to weave these different threads together just by being intellectually curious and having enough technical grounding to kind of say, huh, that feels like it could be important. Mm -hmm. No, that's amazing. Thank you. What keeps you motivated when things get tough? Well, I mean, I, I, I work on stuff that I think is amazingly cool. That's amazingly important. And, you know, that, you know, I'm on this journey with my family and we talk about it and we're in it together and kind of all pulling in the same direction. So I think there's a professional and a personal angle to that question, Michelle. I mean, I have to confess, you know, working over the course of my career, almost a day doesn't go by when you don't pause at some point and think, this is so cool. You know, I'm so lucky to be able to work on these things. Leading on from that, what is the most interesting thing that you've ever worked on? Hard to top saying that you had the chance to work at the CIA, you know, driving in through those front gates every day. It was always, it was always a thrill, you know, and, you know, like any big organization, you have good days and bad days, but you felt like a real sense of mission. And I know a lot of my agency friends, when they leave and go work in corporate jobs, they say, well, the money's great, but the stakes just aren't the same, you know, the sense of mission. But, but I've personally never really had that gap because I've, people have always joked that, you know, working for a big oil company is a lot like working for the foreign ministry of a country because it's big, it's multinational, the kind of issues that you're working with to build a pipeline and build a, you know, you know to drill a well, you know, in deep water. I mean, these are big, multi-million, hundred million, billion dollar, you know, investments, you know, and so, you know, they're, they're, and they involve a lot of things, whether it's economics and politics and local support, you know, people on the ground, you know, media campaigns, uh, technology, go to, in some cases, literally, almost literally go to the moon technology. And so these are big, big things that you're involved with. And so I personally never felt that kind of stepping down in the sense of mission when I moved from government to the private sector or now currently at, at, in the university setting. So I think part of it is what you choose to make of it yourself. For me, working in the seas, hearing that you worked in the CIA is quite exciting for me. I mean, the only question I can think about asking, what is it like to work in the CIA? Because for me, it would be exciting and mind-blowing that you would even do that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I remember, I'm an analyst. I mean, the agency, my job was to sit at my desk and read information yeah, and write analytic reports you know, for you know, the president and the, the foreign policy and national security apparatus of the United States. So, yeah, I was I was an analyst. And as as I am today, you know, as I think probably in my heart, I've always been. <laughs> yeah, that's, I'm an analytical person. But but like I said, you know, I was doing it. In a, in a government organization where, you know, it was a pretty cool place to work. And there was a, there were a real sense of mission. And I know that in many parts of the world, working for government can have a, 
you know, kind of a bad reputation. And I've always said best people I knew at the agency could compete with the best people I knew in the private sector or the best people in the academic world any day. Yeah. And these are people who are not there to make money. They're there to make a difference. And that's, you know, uh, invigorating, inspirational, motivational. Yeah, it is very, very motivational. Thank you. How would you describe your working week? My working week? Yeah. Now? Um, I mean, the, the one big difference is that, you know, in, in a big company, you've got deliverables. You know, mm. there's quarterly reports. There's the annual statistical review. There's the annual long-term outlook. You know, there's always, you know, weekly reports and, you know, that you're doing. In an academic setting, not so much. Uh, you know, it's much more, you know, kind of what, what what are the research projects you're working on? You still have to produce, but it's, uh, you know, not on a, a fixed corporate schedule, if that makes sense. Mm. And so there really is no typical day. Having said that, you know, one thing that I would say is similar between here and, you know, the previous roles that I've had is that what makes the job interesting is that it's something different every day. Yeah. That you get to decide, you know, what's important and how you, you know, what you look at. And so, like I said, I've had the luxury where I worry about what's driving prices at the pump one day. I worry about leadership succession in a country the next day. I worry about, you know, what a new technology, electric vehicles and the cost of batteries. So, you know, the kind of the, the idea that, you know, one day you're working on technology, the next day on policy, the next day on economics, the next day on geopolitics and national security themes, you know, the fact that it's always something different, I think is one of the common threads that I've had. And maybe that's just a function of my own mind and you know, attention deficit disorder <laughs> uh, or, you know, but, but it's also, I think that's the thing that keeps me coming back. I was going to ask you, because you've written a lot of, you've analyzed quite a lot of data and you've written a lot of reports, which one do you think has had the most impact? Oh, it's hard to say. You know, you, how, do, how do you define something like that? I mean, I would say in the public sphere, you know, the, having been associated with the BP Statistical Review of World Energy, you know, it, it's um, you know, been published for over 70 years. You know, I used it when I was an analyst to government before I joined BP. Uh, I still keep a copy of it on my desktop. You know, the Statistical Review of World Energy is widely sorted as a resource, cited as a resource for objective data all over the world, you know, in academic reports, government, investment banks, uh, you know, media, take your pick. So to me, it was a real privilege to be associated with such an institution as that for, for so many years. No, no, it sounds amazing. So who do you depend on the most? Who do I depend on the most? My wife and family. <laughs> that's, that, that's an easy one. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I've observed over the years that, you know, you know the, the, these enterprises, it's not your career. You know, you're, you're working, if you have, if you're fortunate enough to have someone else in your life, you know, you're, you're working together. It's, it's your plural career that, you know, you're all kind of working together to, you know, get, get somewhere and accomplish things. And, you know, I, if my personally, I think that that's been, you know, one, one of the great blessings of my life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. My wife, you know, and children are, have, you know, been kind of part of the, part of the team, you know, all along. Yeah. And that we work hard, I think, yeah, to make sure that we're kind of on the same team. Yeah. And pulling in the same direction. They used to give me one when I would get my BP annual bonus, you know, give each of my kids a small chunk of it and say, Hey, I wouldn't be able to work this hard and, and you know, do as well as I had at work. Yeah. If you hadn't been kind of pulling along, you know, doing, doing, you know, keeping, keeping out of trouble and, you know, being good kids and stuff along the way. And just try to recognize that, you know, when you're, when you're doing these things that you're doing it as part of a team. No, that's really nice. I never really thought about that, that, that you can review your career as not just your own, that it's part of your family as well. My, yeah. As the economist in me says, you know, you're, you're solving a, uh, you're solving an objective function. You're trying to maximize utility along a lot of different dimensions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're trying to yeah, you know, do well in your career, but at the same time, you're also trying to do well in your personal life, you know, with your family, with your friends, with other activities that you have, you know, and you, you know, you don't want to you want you want to be able to kind of 
show progress on all those fronts. And sometimes you have to give up one to do the other one at, at various points, but you know, make sure you're doing it together. No, that's really good advice. Thank you. I was just wondering, because you have a busy, a busy career, how do you handle your daily schedules? Do you have any tips? It, the daily schedule and the pace of work has changed dramatically in the academic world. But you know, I, I personally am a morning person. Yeah. And so, yeah, I would uh, used to get to work at 6 a.m. just because I, I like to have a little bit of quiet time at the beginning of the day to kind of get through things and you know make sure and it worked to my advantage when i w- worked in the us for an english company because it gave me more time to overlap with the team you know in london but i found that personally having that kind of quiet time at the start of the day you know before everything else started buzzing around me uh, was a productive way to spend my, my time okay thank you i was just wondering have you any advice that you can that you can give the younger generation who's looking into coming in that's wanting to pursue a career in the energy sector. Mm-hmm. Well, we've talked a lot already about you know finding something that you have a passion for and then mm-hmm. busting your butt at it. You know, beyond that, you know, right now data is everything. You know, data analytics, data science. You know, I, I know some companies that have abolished their role of chief economist and now they have a chief data analytics officer instead. And, and that, I think, is something that applies to government. It applies to, you know, analytic processes in the academic world as well as in the private sector. So, you know, so data analytics would be one of my things. What was the old movie, The Graduate, where somebody pulled, you know, the young Dustin Hoffman aside and said, plastics. You know, to me, that's, you know, data analytics is the new plastics. You know, it's going to be the thing. But, you know, with uh, you know, these tools are great at pulling data together, but what you really still need on your own is to be able to say, yeah, the data you know is showing a relationship here, but why? And the you, you need to be able to you know understand the tools that you're using, and you know their their constraints or limitations, you know as well as their strengths. And so you still need to be able to. It's not just a matter of piling all the data into a algorithm and saying, go sort it and tell me what's important. You still need to know enough about the co- the subject matter to be able to say, yeah, there's a lot of signals that are coming out of this, you know, analytic process, but that's the one thing that really matters. And that's a matter of knowing your industry or your government's objectives and, you know, trying to, you know, un- have the bigger picture in mind of what end you are trying to apply this analytic tool to. That's really good advice. Thank you. One final question. If you could turn back time, would you change anything? Maybe the haircut I had when I was a sophomore in college, the you know, the, the big bushy, you know, 1970s style hair didn't really go over well in the early 1980s. But I grew up in a small town and you know, time time is always a few years behind <laughs> in the little town. But even that probably I wouldn't change because I've got the picture over my shoulder here on the uh, bookcase. And it's always been a, a good conversation starter and a reminder not to take myself too seriously. You know, beyond that, like I said, I mean, the, the important thing to me is not to regret failures, but to, you know, learn from them and to benefit by having taken the risk to begin with. There's one final thing I was going to ask you, actually considering all your wealth of experience and amazing career, because some of the countries that I have definitely worked in, some of them still rec- struggle to recruit people, especially into the oil industry and the energy sector in general. Is there any advice that you could, you could give on ways that they could combat this issue? Well, I understand the PR challenge that's involved with that I, as a manager in a big you know international energy company I, you know, I, I dealt with it to some degree um but, but again I mean I think the point is try to help people understand the importance of energy in the system today you know the fossil energy in this case how central it is to our well-being what a difference it makes in the quality of people's lives but also that you know the skills you 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 apply can be used elsewhere, you know, and that, you know, the companies change and evolve over time. Um, And you can be part of that. And, you know, the big companies have a global reach, 
they're well financed and uh, you know you get to do a lot of interesting things i mean i worked for bp for many years and i did a lot of work on climate policy climate change you know sustainability issues as well as oil and gas because they mattered to the company so i guess that would be one thought and the other thought is you know that if you have good skills you know there will always be a market for that and so you know you can you know learn and build skills in one organization and then take them somewhere else i've had the good fortune you know to move a couple times in my career each time felt like i was able to leverage experiences that i and skills that i built along the way you know to you know keep 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 moving forward and keep making a difference and keep having fun no that's amazing advice thank you so that's all the questions i have today i would like to thank mark for your time mm-hmm. It's my pleasure, Michelle. And let me just put in a cheap plug for the Baker right Institute. On. If you'd like to learn more about the Institute and its work, including the Center of Energy Studies, where I am, you could just find it at bakerinstitute.org. And yeah, we'll hope to uh, you know see you all at one of our future events. No, excellent. Thank you. That brings us then to the end of another episode. Thank you for listening and see you next week. That brings us to the end of another episode. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, I'd like to gently encourage you to leave a five-star rating wherever you listen to podcasts and share the show with another person. You can also follow me on LinkedIn or via my website, www.michellefraserconsultancy.com. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.